The status quo is a death march, and we must abandon it. Now, I have hope in an empirical sense. Uh, as a scientist, I know that a better world is possible. I know that it's possible for us to keep temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees, to reverse ecological breakdown, and to improve human well-being at the same time. Whether or not we can pull this off depends entirely on the strength of our movements. And to me, this is an important point. I'm often asked, do I have hope for the future? And my point is, look, hope in and of itself is not good enough. Our hope can only ever be as strong as our struggle. And so if we want to improve our hope and feel like hopeful people, we have to build the struggle that is going to be capable of bringing us to that future. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dissense Podcast. I'm your host, Lucas Andreka, and I'm very much honored to be joined by Jason Hickel. He's a degrowth scholar and activist, and his last publication, Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World, has just been translated into German. And I thought to myself, let's invite him to talk about the relationship between capitalism and climate breakdown and how we need to change our economy to meet human and ecological needs. Jason, thank you so much for joining me here. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You argue, Jason, that if we want to survive the crises of our time, above all the ecological crisis, we have to free ourselves from capitalism. Why do you think there is no future with capitalism? <laughs> you go straight for the big questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I think it's really important that we have a clear idea of what we mean when we say capitalism. So capitalism is a system that requires perpetual growth. This is the key element. And what that means is, uh, is ever-increasing quantities of production. And crucially, under capitalism, the purpose of increasing production is not in order to meet human needs, but rather to extract and accumulate surplus value, right? That's the overriding objective. Now, to sustain an ever-rising quantity of surplus value, you have to depress the costs of your inputs. This is so important. And your inputs, of course, are labor and nature. So you're, you're constantly pushing the prices of labor and nature down. And this is why capitalism constantly produces crises of inequality and ecological breakdown, right? Both. And, and these are the dual crises that we face in the world today. Mm. And this happens because capital must, by definition, take more from labor and from nature than it gives back in return, right? It's inherently exploitative in that respect. And we've known that for a long time. But what's, what's now uh, increasingly clear is that this system is not fit for the 21st century, right? It's a 16th century mode of production that we have dragged over the past 500 years into the present, and it's simply not going to work for us anymore. So what we need to do is shift to a post-growth economy, one that's capable of meeting human needs at a high standard with much lower levels of aggregate production. And that objective is just unfortunately, or fortunately for, for others, not compatible with capitalism. Mm. Yeah, so I wrote the book to address a really, I guess, kind of crucial question that has emerged over the past decade. So people now are very clearly widely aware of the crisis of climate change and ecological breakdown. And we're also widely aware that existing efforts to address this crisis are failing, right? The news just keeps getting worse and no progress, no meaningful progress is being made. So the question is, why is this happening, mm. right? Um, is it because we're not trying hard enough? Is it because we don't care? My argument is that it's happening because of the underlying structure of our economic system. So as long as capitalist growth is the core objective of the economy, then we're going to have an extremely difficult time achieving our ecological goals. In most cases, politicians will opt to pursue growth at the expense of ecological goals whenever these two come in conflict. And so that's a problem that we really, we really need to address. Yeah, before we go into more detail why we need that fundamental change in our economic structures and how we make it happen, I just wonder, Jason, how you became an anti-capitalist activist, <laughs> because your book reads like a scientific book, obviously, because you're an economic anthropologist, first and foremost, but it also reads like a political manifesto. So what made you become a degrowth activist? Yeah, no, I mean, my politics emerge from my work as a scientist, right? So... My job is to draw conclusions from empirical data. I, in fact, used to be a kind of run-of-the-mill progressive uh, growthist in the kind of the, the tradition of, let's say, Paul Krugman or something like that, right? But it became very clear to me when I actually looked at empirical evidence on growth and the relationship with resource and energy use and, and ecological impact that this is not a feasible future, right? This idea that even the, even the richest economies in the world need to continue having economic growth is so ingrained that, uh, that everybody takes it for granted. I mean, I took it for granted for most of my career. It's only when you're confronted with, uh, with the question about this that it forces you to rethink these core assumptions. 
And so that process happened for me over over several years of reading scientific literature uh, for my research, and it changed the way I think, honestly. And and now it's clear to me that our existing economic system is not compatible with human flourishing and planetary stability in the 21st century. And my work is simply designed to point that out in the most accessible way that I possibly can. Mm. So I guess that's where it kind of comes from. But I should also mention that my background growing up in Eswatini in Southern Africa, I think played a very important role because my whole life I've been connected to anti-colonial struggles in the global South and social movements in the global South. And that has given me a perspective on the core capitalist economies that I think is different from people who have spent most of their life living in those economies. Because you're able to see it from the outside. You're able to see it from the position of people who are oppressed by it and who suffer the damages from it and who have to deal with the externalized costs of it and so on. Uh, and so being aware of those problems, I think, was always instrumental in uh, leaving me open to the kind of critique that I have uh, that I have developed. So, and really, I must say that I owe a huge intellectual debt to anti-colonial thinkers like uh, Franz Fanon and Thomas Sankara and uh, you know Amy Césaire and so on, who were very who have been very inspiring for me. Uh, and my work is in some ways a kind of tribute to that. Jason, let's talk about why we need degrowth in order to prevent climate disaster, because the mainstream view still seems to be that we actually can have perpetual growth. We just need to decouple it from CO2 emissions, for example, by investing in technologies like renewable energies and more efficiency. The underlying mode of consumption and production is not questioned in those green growth narratives. So why do you think that this is going to fail? Right, so... <laughs> So green growth theory is widespread. It's on the lips of every politician. And basically it claims two fundamental things. The first is that we can continue growing GDP indefinitely while reducing resource use. Okay, And the second thing is that we can continue growing GDP while also at the same time solving the climate crisis. Right. So we have to keep these two different dimensions in mind when we talk about green growth. Mm. Um, and it's important that we are scientific about this, right? So let, let's think about this. Uh, first, regarding the question of resource use, there is no existing evidence of absolute decoupling of GDP from resource use. Okay? In fact, the opposite is happening, where resource use right now globally is rising at a faster rate than, uh, than GDP. Okay? And furthermore, all existing global studies that have been published indicate that absolute decoupling of GDP from resource use will not be accomplished in the future, even under high efficiency scenarios. Okay? And the reason basically is, is simply because in a capitalist economy, the gains from efficiency improvements are basically plowed back into expanding the process of production. And so you quite often achieve relative decoupling, but the scale effect of growth ends up wiping out any absolute gains. Okay? And this is a problem because excess resource use is a major driver of ecological breakdown on other planetary boundaries besides climate change. And we have to pay attention to what's happening there, specifically biodiversity loss. Resource use is the key driver of biodiversity loss and habitat fragmentation and so on. Mm. So that's resource use. Now, the second question has to do with emissions, right? So people will often point to graphs okay, showing rising GDP and declining emissions in several high-income nations, which is clearly absolute decoupling. And they'll say this is evidence of green growth. Now, crucially, we have known this has been happening for decades now. And it happens, of course, because of renewable energy. Okay, so, so shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy allows you to achieve an absolute decoupling of GDP from emissions. But this is not green growth in and of itself. What matters when it comes to the question of green is bringing emissions to zero fast enough to respect the carbon budget for 1.5 or 2 degrees. Okay. Mm. And right now, no country is anywhere near accomplishing this. Okay. So think about it. Um, even if we have some declining emissions in rich countries with rising GDP, if that is not fast enough to keep us under four degrees or three degrees or two degrees, then this is, there's nothing green about this. This is catastrophe, right? So emissions actually brought down to zero fast enough for the Paris climate targets at minimum. And the question becomes, can we accomplish a sufficiently rapid reduction of emissions? And the answer to that is yes, but not if high-income nations continue to pursue growth as a primary objective. And the reason is because more growth means more energy use than would otherwise be the case. Okay? And more energy use makes it more difficult to transition to renewables quickly enough in the short time we have left. Okay? Basically, more energy use makes rapid decarbonization more difficult to achieve. 
And so this is why increasingly scientists and ecological economists are pointing out that if we want to meet our climate objectives, then rich countries, which have very high levels of energy use, vastly in excess of what is required to meet human needs, even at a high standard, are going to have to scale down excess energy use. And you achieve that by reducing less necessary forms of production. Okay, and that's what degrowth is. Mm. So this is important. I mean, green growth narratives may seem fresh and exciting and super high tech and so on. But in fact, they've been around for more than 50 years. This is like a 1970s idea. And proponents of green growth keep claiming that salvation is right around the corner, if just we, we trust enough. But of course, it never, it never actually arrives. And so if we want to be scientific about this question, we need to think much more empirically about the issue. And when we do, it becomes clear that green growth narratives are not going to be sufficient. We need a more robust, more scientifically informed approach. Jason, maybe you could give our listeners a concrete example of how the green growth narrative is flawed and how a shift towards a degrowth perspective would actually look. Since I'm living in Germany, I'm thinking of the transportation sector and especially the automobile industry, which wants to sell uh, private cars in order to make a profit. And they propose the electrification of private cars as a solution to the climate crisis. And of course, it's highly doubtful that, that is going to be sustainable when it comes to energy and resource. So as an example, how can we adopt a degrowth perspective in this sector? Yeah, so this is very important. If you look at the resource use of various countries, you'll see that high-income nations have extremely high levels of resource use. In the region of 28, material tons of stuff per person per year. It's wild, actually. And it's much higher in countries like Germany and the USA and Australia and so on. Mm. Now, this is not a matter of like blaming individuals for a high resource footprint. No, it has to do with the provisioning systems in different economies. And in these rich economies, transport provisioning is done almost entirely in most of the cases, like in the USA, Canada, Australia, and Germany, by private car. Like there's an overwhelming dependence on the automobile industry, which has an interest in maximizing people's dependence on cars. Okay? Mm. Now, we know that private cars are much more resource and energy intensive per passenger kilometer than public transit or bicycles or walking, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so if you switch your provisioning system, your transit provisioning system, from private cars to public transits and e-bikes and so on, you're going to be able to increase people's access to mobility while at the same time dramatically reducing resource use. And so this is an example of how we need to think not just about individual consumption, but rather about the underlying provisioning systems. And this, this happens across sectors. And so if you look at Obviously, right? Like public water systems are more resource and energy efficient than everyone drinking from private bottles, right? Mm. Public healthcare services are much more resource and energy efficient than private ones. And the reason for this discrepancy is simply that in public provisioning systems, the objective is to meet a specific human need rather than to grow corporate profits, right? Uh, and so this allows you to actually accomplish your objectives, your human needs meeting objectives, with much less resource and energy use. And that's really a key lesson for us in ecological economics. Yeah, I guess the one big question when it comes to degrowth is immediately, what about jobs? If you ask people on the street, they either don't know what degrowth is or they associate it with a recession, with something that happened during Corona when they lost their jobs. So how would you propose to them that degrowth is actually something worth pursuing and that they don't need growth to live good lives? Yeah, okay, let's dive into this. Yeah. So degrowth at its very simplest calls for a planned reduction of excess resource use and energy use in high income nations in a manner that is just and equitable, right? Safe, just and equitable. So and also which reduces inequality and ends poverty and improves social outcomes. And this is really quite important. This is what distinguishes degrowth from a recession. Right? A recession is what happens when a growth-dependent capitalist economy fails to grow. Everything falls apart. Right? Poverty goes up, inequality goes up, homelessness goes up, you know, people lose their jobs and their houses and so on. It's, it's a total catastrophe, and this happens every 10 years in a capitalist economy. So a recession is what capitalism does. It rides from crisis to crisis, which is extremely destructive to human beings. Degrowth is totally different. Degrowth is actively about reducing inequality, reducing unemployment, reducing poverty, and reorganizing production around meeting human needs. So what does this look like in concrete terms? It's important that we get to this. Um, it's really quite straightforward. Start by recognizing the fact that right now, the dominant assumption in economics is that every sector of the economy should grow all the time, perpetually, regardless of whether or not we actually need it to, 
Okay. Yeah. This is an absurd and irrational way to manage an economy at the best of times, but in the middle of an ecological crisis, it's clearly madness and deeply dangerous. So instead of assuming that, let's have a conversation, right, about what forms of production we actually want to improve. Things like renewable energy, things like public transit, things like healthcare access. And then also think about what sectors or forms of production are clearly destructive or too big and are socially less necessary and should be actively scaled down, right? So things like private jets, SUVs, air travel, fast fashion, right, industrial beef farming, Advertising, the practice of planned obsolescence, whereby corporations produce goods that are designed to break down after a very short period of time to increase product turnover, and so on. Um, and then, of course, you know, the military industrial complex. There are clearly huge parts of our economy that are organized mostly around corporate profits rather than around human well being. Okay, so recognizing that fact is the most important first step. Mm. Now, most people will agree with this if you ask them to identify parts of the economy that are less necessary and need to be scaled down to reduce excess resource use and energy use. They will have no difficulty identifying what those sectors are. Okay, the question that arises for everybody immediately is what about jobs and livelihoods? If you're going to be uh, reducing less necessary forms of production, what about the jobs that are at stake there? Now, what's interesting and important to recognize here is that ecological economists have proposed a solution to this for several decades. In fact, this solution goes back 100 years. And the solution is simply, as your economy requires less labor to produce the things you actually need, then you shorten the working week and distribute necessary labor more evenly. Okay? Therefore, you take the gains in the form of more leisure time, and you end unemployment in the process, right? Permanently end unemployment. Unemployment is an artificial scarcity produced by capitalist economies, and it doesn't need to exist. We can support that objective by also at the same time introducing a public job guarantee or a climate job guarantee that will allow anyone who wants to train or retrain to participate in the most important collective projects of our generation for the sake of the ecological transition, right? Building out renewable energy capacity, retrofitting homes, insulating buildings, regenerating ecosystems, and so on. So these two principles together ensure that there's no increase in unemployment during this transition. This is the bread and butter of a just transition. At the same time, it's also really important that we expand universal public services and decommodify core social goods, uh, healthcare, education, public transportation, water, energy, internet, all of the basics that people require for survival. Um, we need to ensure that everyone has access to the goods they need in order to live decent, flourishing lives, and decommodifying the core social sector and giving a social guarantee that everyone can access those goods is essential to that objective. Okay, now, the final piece of the puzzle is to reduce inequality dramatically. And this is a really important one. I, I want to briefly dwell on this for a moment, if I may. Sure. People will often ask me, will there be enough income in a degrowth scenario to meet everyone's needs? And the answer is, by definition, yes. Okay. So income is simply, we have to understand, is simply the obverse of prices, the prices of all the stuff that the economy produces uh, every year. Okay. So as long as we are producing the things that we actually need, there will by definition be enough income for people to buy those things. Okay. There will literally never be a shortage of income. The only question we have to address is how is that income distributed? How is purchasing power in the economy distributed? And so it's essential that we distribute purchasing power uh, as fairly and as evenly as possible to ensure that everybody has access to the goods that they need to live good lives. And this is important. The solution to an ecological economy is a fair distribution of income. It's, it's impossible to overemphasize that fact. Mm -hmm. Now, doing things like shortening the working week and introducing a job guarantee and universal basic services, things like that, will automatically improve the bargaining power of labor and therefore improve the working class share of the national income and their access to the national products, right? So that goes a long way towards accomplishing a reduction in inequality. But we can also introduce a wealth tax or a maximum income to ensure that no one is allowed to accumulate so much that they drive ecological breakdown and prevent people from accessing the goods that they need. So this is crucial, I think, to uh, the transition that we require. Yeah, Jason, in your book, Less is More, you cover extensively the relationship between inequality, human well-being and ecology. Maybe you can elaborate a bit more. How does inequality affect our well-being and the ecology? And why are egalitarian societies better for human well-being and the environment? 
Yeah, so we, we know from several studies that inequality is a problem when it comes to both human well-being and ecology, because basically, here's what it does. It induces an extreme form of status anxiety, right? So everybody who is worse off is made to feel shit about themselves and also is in a position of quite often actual impoverishment, no? And so they have to earn and buy more in order to feel okay about themselves, right? And this produces this endless treadmill of unnecessary status production and consumption. And of course, it never ends in the sense of if there's always, if there's always inequality, the rich are constantly pushing the objective out of reach of everybody else, okay? And you can see this very clearly on social media, especially on Instagram. So status anxiety is a crucial part of a capitalist economy. Hmm. And of course, that excess production also has ecological effects. And so not only is, is inequality bad for human well-being, by inducing anxiety, but it's also bad for the environment. Look, uh, it's empirically possible, and this is very exciting research. We know empirically that we can meet human needs at a high standard for everyone on the planet, for 10 billion people, more than we have at present, while at the same time stopping climate breakdown. But that is only possible with a relatively even distribution of resources and energy. Okay. Mm. So that's, I mean, this is effectively what we face, right? Like there's no obstacle to us ending poverty and achieving good standards of living for everybody within the boundaries of our planet. But it's not possible in a highly unequal economy. And this has been demonstrated over and over again by major scientific reports over the past couple of years. So it's crucial that we address this, this problem with urgency. Yeah, it's super crucial because one common misconception I see when it comes to degrowth and promoting is, is that people think it's some kind of radical form of austerity. And it might be that we need to shift away from the consumption of new smartphones, new TVs, new cars in ever shorter intervals. But do they make us happy, actually? Or what could be gained by degrowing those sectors and investing more in, for example, care work or in more free time and more spare time? So maybe explain a bit where this misconception of radical austerity comes from and how we shift the perspective towards one of radical abundance. Yeah, this idea of austerity is totally bogus. The people that make this claim actually have no idea what they're talking about. Let me explain. So austerity is what a capitalist economy does in order to get more growth. Okay, So every time there's some kind of crisis then capitalists want to cut social provisions and introduce artificial scarcities in order to put people in a position where they have to work and produce more, increasing productivity, in order to get growth going again. Okay? So austerity is a child of capitalism. Austerity is a child of growthism. Degrowth calls for exactly the opposite. It wants to expand public services and end unemployment so that growth is no longer necessary for people to live good lives, right? Mm. It is, if anything, a theory of radical abundance. It proposes that abundance, that a radical abundance of access to core social goods is the antidote to growthism, <laughs> uh, is the antidote to capitalism even. One of my colleagues, Yorgos Kallas, frequently points out that capitalism cannot operate under conditions of abundance. And so this is what we are calling for. And I think that's, that's quite an important point to underline. So yeah, I mean, if there's going to be austerity of anything in a degrowth scenario, it's going to be austerity for the rich. <laughs> yeah. We know from empirical modeling that most people's lives will be dramatically improved in a degrowth scenario with the policies that we propose. There will be less economic insecurity. There will be more free time. There will be better relative wages for the working class. There will be better access to high quality healthcare and education and housing and transit, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention, by the way, we get to stop climate and ecological breakdown in its tracks, mm. <laughs> which is quite an attractive proposition. But no, think about it this way. One of the core propositions of degrowth is that we end planned obsolescence, okay? So imagine that our smartphones and our computers and so on, our washing machines and refrigerators, last twice as long as they presently do, okay? What this means is that we therefore consume half as many with no loss to our actual use value of these important products, right? So resource use and energy use involved in those sectors has gone down, and yet we have not lost anything in terms of our access to these core goods, The only people who have lost in this arrangement 
are the capitalists that run corporations that rely on planned obsolescence, right? Their profits go down by half. <laughs> so, and and I, look, I think that we should accept that as a reasonable, as a reasonable outcome. <laughs> Fine by me. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, I really see this argument about austerity being totally disingenuous. These people have not read anything about degrowth scholarship. Even uh, a cursory reading of the existing literature would disabuse them of such ridiculous notions. Jason, all that you're saying sounds so socialist or so eco-socialist. <laughs> so I just wondered, why do you shy away from the label socialism? You don't actually use it in your book. Um, and what's the relationship between your way of thinking and the eco-socialist tradition? Look, my main issue um, is simply that wi like when communicating in public, uh, it's clear that um, a lot of people are stuck in these old, especially the older generation, are stuck in this old like Cold War binary where basically mm. the only two options are effectively American style capitalism and then the misery of, of the late USSR or Stalinism or something like that, right? So that, <laughs> the, the conversation is just so absurdly polarized. And obviously, look, we can acknowledge that we need to, um, to shift to a post-capitalist economy with several crucial socialist principles, which, by the way, are not alien to most people, are actively desired by most people, including, you know, universal public provisioning, mm. which all of us enjoy to some extent in our lives and we want more of, right? <laughs> so, so these are core socialist uh, principles, which have been the, 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 the main determinants of social progress over the 20th century. So let's embrace what is clearly good there. But also recognize that, the, you know, the post-capitalist economy of the 21st century does not need to look like a command and control Soviet economy, necessarily, okay? Um, in the sense that, to me, reading the, the history of the 20th century, the main problem with these states, right, was the fact that they were not democratic. The, like, there was no real economic democracy. Yeah. Um, and so I align with the principle of economic democracy. And I would, I would like to see that brought into our discussion about, uh, about what socialist futures might look like. So yes, look, I mean, degrowth scholars, uh, I would say probably most of them align with uh, eco-social thought. In fact, degrowth in some ways emerges from eco-socialist traditions. If by eco-socialism we simply mean a society that delivers, that, that is organized around supporting human well-being with a democratized means of production, right, and accomplishes those goals within ecological limits. This is the, the basic definition of eco-socialism, and obviously degrowth aligns with this. But here's the thing is that many degrowth scholars will simply point out that eco-socialism does not exhaust the horizons uh, of our imagination, okay? Uh, because if we look at critiques of growth and capitalism from the global south and from feminist perspectives and from many other perspectives, it becomes clear that there's a plurality of post-capitalist visions. Mm. And we need, to, we need to create space for that broader discussion and for those pluralities so that the 21st century is not a single story, but makes room for a diversity of stories. Uh, and so I think that's probably the main objection that some degrowth scholars would, would have with aligning explicitly with eco-socialism. But for the most part, I mean, their findings, their conclusions are very similar. By the way, I wonder, Jason, if there are any historical examples where the kind of degrowth program, the planned reduction of production and consumption uh, at any point was successfully implemented and what we can learn from it. Um, no, no, degrowth has never been tried in a systematic way before. Of course, there are several things that we can learn from historical examples. Take the US and European economies during World War II. There was an immediate transformation of these economies for the sake of supporting human needs by redirecting productive capacity around human welfare and, of course, the war efforts mm. away from other forms of private production and consumption. Okay, so, so when there is an emergency, we know that this can happen. Oh, by the way, we saw it again during the COVID-19 epidemic. During the middle of the crisis, it was clear that suddenly there's an emergency break. Countries can pull it and slow down certain sectors of the economy. Of course, pointing to the COVID-19 crisis is not a good example for degrowth because the sectors that were slowed down in most cases were ones that we really need or that, that are crucial to human well-being. Things like schools and gyms and cafes, you know, things that are crucial to human conviviality. Yeah. What we need to be doing instead is using that same tool, but to slow down less necessary forms of production, say for SUVs or private cars or private jets or, you know, industrial beef production or trawling, etc. So, mm. but we know the tool exists, we just have to deploy it. But we also know from ecological economics that there are many nations in the world that manage to achieve very strong social outcomes with relatively little by way of resource and energy use. And we know that they do that basically through strong forms of public provisioning. Over and over again, 
public provisioning of core social goods is crucial to meeting human needs at a high standard with low ecological impacts. And that's a, a really crucial lesson that we take from the existing data. Jason, I would like to talk a bit more about the relationship between economic growth on the one hand and human well-being or happiness on the other hand, because in your book, you actually debunk a lot of misconceptions about this relationship. Still, a lot of people think that you need economic growth in order to achieve human well-being, but um, you show that's actually not true, that we have to look at other indicators And you also bring comparisons between countries, which I found interesting. For example, you compare the United States to Costa Rica and you show that Costa Rica scores higher on happiness scores than the USA, which is, of course, a much, much richer country. So maybe you can elaborate a bit more about the relationship of economic growth and human well-being. Yeah, the first and most important thing to understand here is that GDP growth is not an increase in social value or in use value or in well-being or in anything that most people think it is. It's not, it's not an increase in livelihoods or in provisioning. It's very narrowly defined. It is an increase in the total quantity of commodified goods and services in the economy. Okay? Mm. So, and by commodified goods and services, I mean goods and services that are bought and sold on the market. Because GDP excludes the majority of things that are not bought and sold on markets. Okay? Now, clearly, there is no automatic relationship between increasing production of commodified goods and human well-being. It literally all depends on what we are producing, right? And whether people have access to those things. So are we producing tear gas or healthcare? If we're producing good things like healthcare, do people have access to them? Or are they so expensive because they're privatized or enclosed that people can't access them? And so this question of what we're producing and whether people have access to them is absolutely essential to determining the relationship between growth and human well-being. Mm. And this is what explains the fact that several dozen countries outperform the USA on core social indicators, despite significantly less GDP per capita. Okay, So the USA is a core example because it's one of the richest countries in the world. It is the most advanced capitalist economy. And so if we're going to assume that capitalism is the way to go, then the USA is our example. Right? The USA achieves a life expectancy of around 77 years. Now compare that to, for example, Spain. Spain outperforms the USA on core social indicators, including with a life expectancy that is at least five years longer, perhaps even six years longer, with a GDP per capita of 55% less than the USA, right? How is that possible? <laughs> It's because the USA has extremely wasteful forms of production that are organized mostly around corporate profit mm. rather than around human well-being. Spain does a better job at ensuring people have access to core goods that they need, and that's why their social indicators are better. Costa Rica, as you mentioned, is another example. Now, Costa Rica has 80% less GDP per capita than the USA, um, and yet outperforms the USA in life expectancy and has a level of reported well-being that matches the Scandinavian countries, so one of the highest in the world. And it accomplishes this with very low levels of ecological impacts. Mm. So um, this is not to say that Costa Rica is perfect, you know, far from it. But it is an example of how, again, focusing on core public provisioning systems is a very effective way at ensuring you deliver high levels of well-being with relatively low uh, resource and energy use. Okay, if we recognize that GDP is not a good measurement for human well-being, mm. how can we actually measure human well-being? And is it just enough to change the measurement method? Right. So it's, it's actually really widely recognized that GDP is a problematic indicator. Even several leading mainstream economists recognize this fact. And there are, of course, several alternative approaches. The first, probably most popular one, is the genuine progress indicator. Okay? Mm. So it's called the GPI. Here's what the GPI does. It corrects GDP in the sense that GDP only measures production, but does not measure the social and ecological costs of production. So GPI subtract, effectively just subtracts social and ecological costs, so that we get a clear picture of what's happening in the economy and whether it's delivering real progress or if it's just delivering progress for capitalism, <laughs> right? I mean, GDP, and, th and this is important, ultimately GDP is a measure of the welfare of capital, not a measure of the welfare of humans. Yeah. So GPI is one alternative. But several ecological economists argue that instead what we should have is more of a dashboard approach uh, instead of a single indicator, which can hide quite a lot. 
you actually want to be able to focus on your actual objectives, right? So if you have specific social objectives, like improving access to housing and healthcare, improving wages, improving you know, life expectancy, then make those your targets and, and pursue policies that improve those directly. And if you have ecological objectives, such as you know, improving soil quality and reducing emissions, make those your targets and pursue policies that deliver on those directly, <laughs> rather than hoping that pursuing growth will magically deliver on your social and ecological objectives, which of course, it virtually never does, uh, right? Mm. So we need a more rational way of thinking about the economy and how to manage it. And, uh, and these are some of the core proposals. Maybe you can talk a bit about the political, mental and societal obstacles when it comes to actually applying a degrowth program. So because if research, as you suggest here, points in the direction that uh, a post-capitalist society would be better for human well-being, but also for the climate, then one has to wonder why the fuck doesn't it happen? <laughs> why don't we go in that direction? So what, what in your view are the major reasons that um, this position is still so marginal and which obstacles do we face? Yeah, no, this is important, right? So the major challenge to degrowth scholarship over the past decade has been to demonstrate that it is possible to have a degrowth scenario that at the same time improves human well-being. And that has now been demonstrated. So that's very exciting. The question now becomes about the political feasibility mm -hmm. of it. Now, we've demonstrated, again, that in a degrowth scenario, the majority of people will be better off. The problem is that there is a small faction of our society, the ruling class, no? <laughs> that clearly stands to lose quite a lot from such a transformation, from such a transition. The people that benefit from the existing structure of the world economy are obviously very against any possibility of, of degrowth, since growth isn't obviously, and capitalism is what sustains their privileges. So, so, this, so this becomes an issue, right? It's, uh, it's effectively, what we're talking about is effectively a political mm. battle. We know that there is very strong support for core degrowth policies that I've mentioned. Things like a shorter working week, a public job guarantee, living wages, you know, a fair distribution of income. There's very strong support. The question is, why do we not see these policies coming into play? After all, we live in democracies. You would expect that the wishes of the majority would be implemented as policy. But in fact, this doesn't happen. And the reason is, of course, because we don't have real democracies. <laughs> And this is a major barrier to political transformation. We have political systems that are overwhelmingly captured by elite interests, right? Uh, through things like campaign finance laws that allow rich people to effectively buy campaigns and politicians, institutionalized corruption, even in countries that are, you know, in the G7, right? <laughs> I mean, the US and the UK are prime examples of this. And also we have media systems that are beholden to corporate interests and concentrated in the hands of a very small number of companies. These are all major problems to the kind of democratic discussion and policymaking that is required to achieve a just and ecological transition. And so a demand for democratization has to be at the core of our demands for an eco-social transition. I think that's really essential. Yeah, I totally agree. Our fight also has to be a fight for democratization, otherwise we will fail. But it seems also, Jason, that we have to fight an hegemonic battle about imaginations, about ideas, about ideology. Because when I look around, it seems that a lot of people are actively embracing our way of living, which is disastrous for the climate, but also disastrous for less well-off people in the world. And they either do it because they don't give a fuck or they do it because um, they can't imagine something else. They can't imagine a post-capitalist society. So what do we have to do to win this ideological battle? Yeah, look, I think that one of the reasons for the hegemony of growthism is because it's a very ideological terrain in the sense of for years it has been drummed into us that growth is necessary for social progress, is necessary for human well-being improvements, is, is necessary for everything good, right? It's a very powerful metaphor. Children grow, plants grow, we like things to grow. Who doesn't, right? It's deeply rooted in a sense of being natural. So, and this is an amazing ideological opportunity for capital to be able to sell its projects of expansionism and accumulation and exploitation, right? Under the banner of growth, so, and this is what uh, the scholar Timothy Mitchell refers to as capital's alibi, right? Mm. By saying that it is increasing growth, it's able to get us to buy into projects we might otherwise reject, right? Mm. 
Um, so to the extent that growth does depend on ecological destruction and human exploitation and colonial plunder and so on, we might, as moral beings, want to reject those things. But as long as it's framed in the language of growth, then it's very effective at getting us to buy into it, right? And, and, and this is really a difficult ideological work that we have to do. We have to be able to have a clear discussion about what growth is and whether we want it or not. And only once we can have that discussion, I think, is there a possibility for us moving forward. So, and this is really what degrowth aims to do, is to start that discussion. Yeah, it's quite a task. In your book, you call it the decolonization of our thinking. And it goes so deep, it goes back to the Enlightenment thinking um, that established like an exploitative way of thinking about nature and thinking about the colonialized subjects. So, and you also cite indigenous communities, which obviously have another way of thinking about nature and thinking about human beings within nature. So maybe you can talk a bit more about what that decolonization of thinking entails. Yeah, so, um, so this emerges actually from my study of the history of capitalism. And as any historian of capitalism will tell you, what capitalism required in the 15th and 16th centuries in order to get going was, of course, mass enclosure, kicking peasants off the land and forcing them into uh, a competitive labor market and so on, right? You know, this, of course, was essential to the very possibility of you know, primitive accumulation and reinvestment for expansion of production and so on. But at the same time, that alone was not enough, right? So a transformation in the fundamental means of production was not enough for capitalism to get going. It also needed a new story about nature. And this is such an important part of that history. In the 15th and 16th centuries, even in Europe, the dominant uh, ontology, the dominant philosophical understanding of being was that humans are fundamentally interconnected with the rest of the living world. They accepted no fundamental distinction between humans and non-human beings in some kind of hierarchy, right? In fact, what they did is they related to non-human beings and to ecosystems and the land, et cetera, as kin, right? In a relationship of reciprocity. And early capitalists clearly recognized this as a barrier to the capitalist form of production because you need to somehow be able to separate people from nature and put them into a position where they're willing to extract and dominate and exploit nature. You know? mm -hmm. um, and they found their solution in the ideas of Enlightenment thinkers like Descartes and Bacon, who were arguing at that very same time that we should understand that humans alone have spirit and agency and consciousness, and the non-human world is merely matter, is merely objects. So humans are subjects, nature is an object. This is called dualism, and it provided the moral license, the philosophical justification for a new economic system that abolished this understanding of reciprocity with the lands and instead put people in positions of exploitation and domination over the lands. This very idea was spread across the world during the European colonial projects. You know, animist ideas were always considered to be backward and had to be abolished uh, in favor of European dualist thinking. So this was effectively, you know, a core part of the colonial projects. It was an elite ideology that was imposed on the European masses and then on the colonized populations of the rest of the world. And indigenous scholars have been pointing out for several uh, decades now, very clearly in their writings and teachings, that this is a core problem of Western philosophical thought, and it needs to be addressed if we're going to have an eco-social economy, right? So we need to restore this principle that humans are fundamentally interdependent with the rest of the living world and should have an economy that enters into a relationship of care and reciprocity with nature rather than a relationship of domination and extraction. Yeah, when it comes to how we think about the world, we can certainly learn a lot of from indigenous ways of thinking about the relationship between humans and nature, but it only goes so far, I guess. And that's why I wonder if you also see resources within enlightenment thought to sort of save enlightenment from itself. Yeah, it's a good question. So first of all, let me just clarify for your listeners. My, uh, my references to indigenous philosophy are intended to highlight their critique of Western ontological assumptions, okay? And importantly, their ideas about this are not some kind of timeless, ahistorical culture, right? They emerged, according to several scholars uh, in this tradition, they emerged precisely in the encounter with European colonialism, which was deeply ecologically destructive and deeply destructive to human communities, especially in the Americas, where a massive genocide, of course, occurred. In the wake of this disaster, there was a clear recognition that we can never accept this again. What, you know, what is it about the worldview of the colonizers that allowed them to inflict such extraordinary damage? 
And their point is that the core kernel of European thought that did that was, was effectively dualism, right? And so this is what they reject um, as part of a long process of the critique of European colonization, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is not to romanticize indigenous thought and it's not to say that everybody has to adopt indigenous ways of thinking about this and so on. There are clearly resources within the Western philosophical tradition itself that point in the very same direction. And I have in mind here particularly one scholar, one very famous Enlightenment thinker by the name of Spinoza, who was a contemporary of Descartes. Uh, he watched Descartes rise into fame during this period when capitalists were making use of his ideas to justify the transition to capitalism and the destruction of more ecological, democratic uh, ways of being in Europe. And he rejected Descartes' core ideas. You know, Spinoza explicitly said, look, Descartes' dualism is wrong. There's clearly no evidence that humans are somehow fundamentally separate from and superior to nature, right? And Spinoza was proved right over and over and over again in the centuries after that by scientists uh, from Darwin onward who demonstrated this to be the case, that humans are not the only beings with consciousness, that they are in fact co-evolved with nature, et cetera, et cetera. And what's necessary to happen here is simply that we align our consciousness to scientific findings rather than to the outdated uh, mythologies of Bacon and Descartes that so beguiled Western uh, elites of the 17th century. Jason, when we look at all these obstacles, the decolonization of our thinking, first and foremost, but also the obstacles that you described in power structures, privileged classes, and media bias that um, all profit from the current system. When you see all these obstacles, which stars do we have to align in order for us to get to a degrowth path? So what's your theory of transformation? What gives you hope? Yeah, look, I think that the, the existing theory is totally going to fail us. Right? The existing theory is basically, let us leave this up to our leaders and to the climate negotiators and to the corporations, et cetera, et cetera. This is fundamentally not going to work. And the sooner we recognize that, the better our chances of surviving the 21st century will be, right? So what instead is necessary? I insist that a strong, aggressive political movement is going to be necessary. And this cannot be simply environmentalists alone, right? I mean, of course, Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion have been important political forces. They've changed our discourse about climate in a few short years, but they do not have the, uh, the material political power to pull off the kind of transition that is required, given the fact that it runs against the interests of the ruling class. What is going to be required for that is an alliance with working class formations and labor unions towards accomplishing a just transition. So mm -hmm. environmentalists need to get on board with the core social policies that we propose, which will take the question of livelihoods off the table for working class communities and allow them in turn to unite with environmentalists over core ecological demands. Only once the question of livelihoods and jobs is taken off the table, once that question is dealt with permanently, right, with a shorter working week and a job guarantee and universal basic services and a fair distribution of income, then can we have an open conversation about what sectors of the economy can be scaled down without worrying about the specter of unemployment? So that alliance is going to be essential. And existing labor unions may not be in a position to do that. This is going to require a different, more radical form of unionism. So that's important. I think also alliances with social movements in the global south are essential here. Uh, global South social movements have a much more radical and accurate and analytically rigorous understanding of the crisis. They recognize this as a crisis not primarily of technology, right? Not to be solved primarily by technology, but to be solved by addressing the deep underlying structural causes, namely capitalism and its imperialist relations with the rest of the world. And so we need to be aligning with Global South social movements, supporting their demands in the climate negotiations. Uh, they're the ones that have skin in the game. Now, this alignment of social forces, I believe, has the potential to pull off a dramatic transformation of the world economy. Uh, if you think about what social movements have been able to accomplish in the past, everything from the labor movements uh, of the 1940s and 50s to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s to the anti-colonial movements of that same era, these movements transformed the world in the, many, in the middle of the 20th century. And that needs to happen again and is going to require no less a mobilization. Uh, so the, the sooner we get to work building those alliances, building those solidarities, 
the better because that that's the size of the movement that we're going to need. So that's, to me, a crucial uh, instruction, I guess, for the coming years. Unfortunately, Jason, our time is up. So one last question. What kind of scenarios do you see for the future of our societies? And what do you think will happen if we don't manage to bring about the great transformation that we talked about here? No, no, the, uh, the alternative is very, very bad. The status quo that we're headed for, I cannot emphasize this enough, is really not compatible with organized human civilization as we know it. There is no progress with the status quo. So it's, it's essential to realize that. The world that we will inhabit by 2070, uh, which is within the lifetimes of the present generation, is going to be a real dystopian disaster. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you, you simply need to read the latest IPCC reports to make this abundantly clear. The status quo is a death march, and we must abandon it. Now, I have hope in an empirical sense Uh, as a scientist, I know that a better world is possible. I know that it's possible for us to keep temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees, to reverse ecological breakdown, and to improve human well-being at the same time. Whether or not we can pull this off depends entirely on the strength of our movements. And to me, this is an important point. I'm often asked, do I have hope for the future? And my point is, look, look hope in and of itself is not good enough. Uh, our hope can only ever be as strong as our struggle. And so if we want to improve our hope and feel like hopeful people, we have to build the struggle that is going to be capable of bringing us to that future. And that's really the imperative that we face today. Jason, thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks.